Hello, my name is Dr. James DeFrancisco, and today we are going to look at the Gospel of Thomas. So let me get my slideshow organized here. Okay, the Gospel of Thomas is known as the hitting, hidden or the secret sayings of the living Jesus. And here's some visuals for you. We have a section up here that shows some of the fragments of the Gospel of Thomas. It's really hard to read the letters there. I think those are the Greek frag fragments that have come from Oxyrhynchus. Over here is a picture of a cave that the uh, Gospel of Thomas was found in. Down here are uh, examples of codex um, books of uh, the Gospel of Thomas. And here's a very small picture. I'll show you a better one later that will give you an idea of what Coptic looks like for those of you who are not familiar with that language. The Gospel of Thomas consists of 114 sayings of Jesus' teachings. The Coptic Gospel of Thomas is part of the Nag Hammadi collection, which consists of 13 books containing 50 different texts. Some of these sayings that are in the Gospel of Thomas sound very similar to the canonical Gospels in the Bible, but some are also more puzzling, enigmatic, and esoteric. There's no narrative, no birth story about Jesus' birth, no miracles, no passion, and no resurrection story in the Gospel of Thomas. This book is probably from an oral tradition similar to the traditions that shaped the canonical Gospels, and probably written around the time of the four canonical Gospels, the biblical Gospels, that is somewhere around 70 CE or AD uh, to 100 AD, maybe 140, uh, and then developed in the second through the fourth centuries, probably starting in a Semitic language like Aramaic is the most probable, and then going into Greek as found in Oxyrhynchus or Coptic as found later in the uh, Nagamadi. It was circulated widely, and I'll show you a map to give you an example of what exactly I mean by that. And uh, there's also many scholars who believe that there was a Syriac element in this gospel, possibly in its origin or more probable in its development. Syriac is an Aramaic dialect cognate with Hebrew, and then later it went into Coptic, uh, which we have at Nagamadi, and the Greek, which was found at Oxyrhynchus. The gospel as a whole gospel was lost, even though we knew of it. It was mentioned by ancient sources, but no one had a copy of it until 1945, when the Coptic gospel was found in Nagamadi. It was a huge discovery for learning about the early Christian Gnosticism. And it's exotic and interesting due to its contrast with the canonical gospels. Nagamadi is down here, uh, which is about 350 some miles from Cairo. And then Oxyrhynchus is over here, about 100 miles from Cairo. And to put this in perspective, Jerusalem is about 350 miles northeast. And then if we go into Syria, in Edessa, a center of learning there, that's about 350 miles away from Jerusalem. So this gospel got around in ancient times, in the very first few centuries. In 1897 to 1904, excavations found Greek fragments at Oxyrhynchus over here. And then in 1945, the full gospel was found 
in its Coptic form at Nagamadi. It's a sayings collection, which are pithy sayings similar to proverbs and parables, words of wisdom. In many respects, they're similar to Zen koans. Some of the uh, sayings are very puzzling. When you read them and contemplate on them, you wonder, what does it mean? Where is this going? And over here, we have another example of Coptic script. This is a little bit easier to read. Most of these are Greek letters with some unique Coptic letters added. The authorship of this gospel, uh, it says in the very first prologue, the opening of the gospel, these are the secret sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Didymus Judas Thomas recorded. Didymus and Thomas both mean the same thing. They both mean twin. They're literally a nickname for Judas, which is an anglicized form of the Hebrew Yehuda. Uh, so the writer that's attributed to in the prologue is probably a man named Yehuda, at least the core sayings. Uh, and then his nickname was the twin. Now this created problems for the church because you wonder the twin of whom? Is this the twin of Jesus? That's the common interpretation. And then this book was developed and circulated by Thomasine Christians, followers of Thomas. It raises the question, does the book have one author or multiple authors? Were there scribes and redactors who altered the text, who added to it, and perhaps changed some of the text? Was it a development over time? That's a question that scholars wrestle with. Some scholars emphasize that yes, it was developed over time, and that's my position. The most probable date for the beginning of this gospel is the second century CE. And then the Coptic form that we have is dated to sometime in the fourth century prior to 350 CE. The Greek fragments that were found at Oxyrhynchus are dated to around 200 CE. Scholars believe that the Aramaic core text has a possible dating somewhere between 40 to 140 CE or AD. The Aramaic probability, let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Very few scholars will argue with that. There's a handful of scholars that believe Jesus spoke primarily Hebrew. And there's a very few scholars who believe that Jesus spoke primarily Greek. 99.9% um, .9 of the scholars throughout the world would say his main language, his lingua franca, was Aramaic. Craig Evans believes that Logion 54 is very similar to Matthew 5.3. Let me read Logion 54 for you. It says, congratulations to the poor. For to you belongs heaven's domain, or blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. I'm sure that sounds familiar to you. It also compares with Tashian's uh, diatessaron in Syriac Aramaic, and uh, Perrin takes that viewpoint, and the diatessaron was written somewhere around 172 CE in Syriac, in Aramaic. And the wording in this gospel is very similar to that. The syntax, the grammar uh, compares with that closely. According to April DeConnick, the gospel was carried from Jerusalem to Eastern Syria and developed over time. The theology in this gospel is the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a kingdom within the people. It's not somewhere up in heaven. Gnosticism is added and developed into some of the sayings. Approximately 50% of the sayings are Gnostic. The other 50% of the sayings are very similar to the canonical gospels. And we'll take a look at that. Salvation 
comes through knowledge, and this is the Gnostic perspective. The sacrificial blood of the cross is not mentioned at all anywhere in this gospel. The cross is only mentioned in one logion or saying, and it uh, looks like it's from a core text from the synoptic gospels. Let's talk a little bit about Gnosticism. Gnosticism was very diverse. It was a religiously eclectic movement. There wasn't just one form. It was very popular in the second through the sixth century. Some argue it's never really gone away. I know a Gnostic bishop. It drew on Eastern religions like Zoroastrianism. There were some Christian forms and some non-Christian. Salvation came through gaining secret knowledge or gnosis. There was an inner group of the, the elite initiates who received this knowledge. It wasn't just head knowledge. It wasn't, it wasn't just intellectual knowledge. It was a transformation of the person, that type of knowledge. There was elaborate mythological divine light scattered throughout the world, trapped in bodies. This was the view of Gnosticism. And we must liberate the divine from these bodies. So the body doesn't mean much in Gnosticism. It's the divine spark or light that's within the body that counts. So you have this dualism of light versus darkness, spirit versus body. And this creates somewhat of a dilemma because the uh, Gospel of Thomas also emphasizes oneness, non-dualism. So you have both coming out of this gospel. The world and the body are not redeemable. So again, the body means nothing. It's the, the light that means everything. Gnosticism is related to the Gospel of Thomas. Its teachings impart new saving knowledge. It doesn't cover anything about Jesus' physical existence. As I mentioned, the birth, passion, death, or resurrection are not mentioned. It could be very ascetic and anti-femininity, or conversely, more libertine in rituals. So Gnostics um, were very diverse. They, they varied from, on the one hand, people who were very disciplined um, monastics to uh, libertines, people who were very hedonistic. The body didn't mean anything, so you can do whatever you want with it. They tend to reject the Jewish Bible, the Christian Old Testament, and its depiction of God. Wisdom is in the teachings, and that can be a powerful spiritual connection leading to transformation and not merely intellectual knowledge. So let's ask this question. Is this gospel Gnostic? And if so, how so? Well, let's start with uh, Logian verse 1. It says, and he said, it doesn't describe who the he is. It could be Jesus or it could be Didymus Judas Thomas. Nevertheless, and he said, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. This idea of not tasting death is uh, interspersed throughout a number of logia in, in this gospel, and that's a Gnostic idea. In Logia 62, Jesus said, I disclose my mysteries to those who are worthy of my mysteries. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. The first half of that saying is very Gnostic. Disclosure of mysteries to those who are worthy. The second half of that saying sounds like the synoptics, where Jesus said, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In Logion 108, Jesus said, whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become that person, and the hidden things will be revealed to them. Very nasty. So how is this gospel similar to Luke's portrait of Jesus and the synoptics? Well, let's look at Logion number nine. 
And this will sound familiar to you, even if you've never read the Gospel of Thomas. Look, the sower went out, took a handful of seeds, and scattered them. Some fell on the ground on the road, and the birds came and gathered them. Others fell on rock, and they didn't take root in the soil and didn't produce heads of grain. Others fell on thorns, and they choked the seeds, and worms ate them. And others fell on good soil, and it produced a good crop. It yielded 60 per measure and 120 per measure. And it stops there. And I'm sure you recognize it sounds a lot like what we have in Matthew chapter 12. The main difference is it stops with presenting the parable. It doesn't give any explanation. And many scholars believe that that's evidence that this may be earlier than what we have in the Gospel of Matthew. Because the Gospel of Matthew appears to be redacted by a scribe who wanted to add the interpretation. Typically, when a saying like this was given, the person who spoke it, like Jesus, would not give the explanation. Would let the listener figure out what the parable meant. And that, that's the way I would recommend that these sayings be studied. That we not read one logion after another, but we read the logion, we meditate on it. We then, after we ourselves try to glean something from it, then look at commentaries and books that have notes of what other people see in it and try to figure that logion out, then go to the next one. If we go to Logion 16, Jesus said, perhaps people think I have come to cast peace upon the world. They do not know that I have come to cast conflicts upon the earth, fire, sword, war. For there will be five in a house, and there'll be three against two, and two against three, father against son, and son against father, and they will stand alone. Now, that sounds, in the beginning, the first couple of lines, it sounds very much like the synoptics. Then in the third and fourth line, it sounds more like a Gnostic position. If we look at Logion 26, Jesus said, you see the sliver in your friend's eye, but you don't see the timber in your own eye. When you take the timber out of your own eye, then you will see well enough to remove the sliver from your friend's eye. This sounds very much like what we have in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 and to 5, and what we have in Luke chapter 6, verses 41 and 42. In Logion 54, Jesus said, congratulations to the poor, for to you belongs heaven's domain, or blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven that we see in Luke chapter 6, verse 20. Very much like the synoptics. If we go on to Logion 73, Jesus said, the crop is huge, but the workers are few. So beg the harvest boss to dispatch workers to the fields. Sounds a lot like Luke chapter 10, verse 2. 86, Jesus said, foxes have their dens and birds have their nests, but human beings have no place to lie down and rest. Sounds like Matthew 8, verse 10, or Luke 9, 58. 99. The disciples said to him, your brother, brothers, and your mother are standing outside. He said to them, those here who do what my father wants are my brothers and my mother. They are the ones who will enter my father's domain. That sounds a lot like Luke chapter 8, verse 19 to 21, and Mark chapter 3, verse 33 to 35, and Matthew chapter 12 verses 47 to 50. 
All right. Well, how is Thomas different in uh, the way it presents Jesus from the synoptic gospels? Well, let's look at 22. In well, again, 22, Jesus saw some babies nursing. He said to his disciples, these nursing babies are like those who enter the Father's domain. Father's domain here could also be translated with uh, kingdom of heaven, um, which you are probably more familiar with. They said to him, then shall we enter the Father's domain as babies? And Jesus said to them, when you make the two into one, and when you make the inner like the outer, and the outer like the inner, and the upper like the lower, and when you make male and female into a single one, so that male will not be male, nor the female be female, when you make eyes in place of an eye, a hand in place of a hand, a foot in place of a foot, an image in place of an image, then you will enter the Father's domain. That's very Gnostic and very unlike anything we find in the synoptics. The last log in 114 is also very different. Here we have Simon Peter said to them, make Mary leave us for females don't deserve life. And Jesus said, look, I will guide her to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males for every female who makes herself male will enter the domain of heaven very gnostic very different from the synoptic gospels let's now take a moment and look at a couple of these logians and contemplate or meditate on them a little bit i'll start with uh, logion two jesus said those who seek should not stop seeking until they find. And when they find, they will be disturbed. And when they are disturbed, they will marvel and will rule over all. So when you look at this for a moment, think about it, relax, close your eyes, do whatever you need to do to relax and meditate. And just contemplate on this for a minute or two. Pause the recording and then come back. Okay, now that you've done that, what have you come up with? Think about that. You may want to write down some notes. And then look at one of the references that I'll recommend for you. Or one that you yourself like that maybe is not on my list. And see what you come up with. What do you come up with? What do others come up with? What does this login mean? Having done that, let's go on to login 70. Jesus says, if you bring forth that which is within you, and that which you have will save you. If you do not have that within you, then that which you do not have within you will kill you. Let's do the same thing with that. Absorb it into your mind. Relax, meditate, contemplate it. And then come back after a minute or two. Okay, what did you come up with? Do you see the resemblance to Zen coins. Some of these are a little difficult to decipher. And I picked two that I think get to the heart of this gospel. Because when we look at what uh, this gospel is really about, I think it's about seeking for knowledge. It's about integration of that knowledge and oneness, integration of ourselves, integration of ourselves with other people, the inner and the outer. And it's about bringing knowledge from within yourself, bringing that out. That's why I think it's important to uh, look at this from a contemplative perspective before you go on and uh, 
read other commentary about it. Here are some references that you can use to enrich your study. The first one from William Mont, Bush, Quisbel, Till, and Almasi, the Gospel According to Thomas, is a very brief, it's a thin book. I have a copy of it right here. You can see it's not very big. And what it does, and I know you're not going to be able to see this real clearly, but it has the Coptic on the one side and the English translation on the other. Doesn't have much in terms of notes as an introductory section, virtually no commentary. Christer and Patterson, The Gospel of Thomas, Does It Contain Authentic Sayings of Jesus? is an article that you can find online. Uh, and it uh, discusses that idea, is this really connected with authentic sayings that Jesus said? Le Loop, The Gospel of Thomas, is an excellent book that will provide you with not only a good translation, but also a good commentary. Linson, The True Words of Thomas, Interactive Coptic English Translation. Uh, and I um, may give you a glimpse at that here in a few minutes. Uh, that's available online. And the benefit of that is that it contains not only an interactive, interlinear translation with the Coptic, but if you point and click on the Coptic words, you can bring up a lexicon. And for those of you that want to do serious study, you could really get into the Coptic text. Meyer, The Gospel of Thomas, The Hidden Sayings of Jesus, is another excellent uh, text. The Complete Gospels, which I was reading from here by Miller and Funk, is a, a good source. I like it. I have most of my notes in it. Uh, I'm not happy with his translation of um, the imperial rule. I would prefer kingdom of heaven because of my Aramaic background. When I compare the word that's translated kingdom in Greek, Basileia, it has the connotation of a king, a monarch, subjects, rule, and rules that go with that, and a territory. But when I look at the root source of the word Malkuta, which is the word for kingdom in Aramaic, is more with the counsel or the wisdom coming from God. Matter of fact, the Aramaic word for slota comes from the root, root sla, which means to, to set a trap, to trap God's thoughts. So in Aramaic, there's no difference between prayer and meditation. So that's why uh, I think it's valuable when we study this gospel and any ancient text that is a sayings text to contemplate, to meditate, basically to pray like uh, Lectio Divina, getting into the text itself. Miller uh, also has another book, which is called the, that's not actually Miller, it's Robert Funk and Hoover, The Five Gospels, which includes notes on the Gospel of Thomas, which is good. And I don't have that one on the list. Nottingham, Theodore Nottingham, has the book, The Lost Gospel of Thomas, which is an excellent book for those of you who would like a more metaphysical approach in terms of the commentary. And Patterson, Beth J. and Robinson have the book, The Fifth Gospel, The Gospel of Thomas Comes of Age, very scholarly work, but it's very readable. Excellent book to study on the uh, Gospel of Thomas. Okay, now let me see. Um, I will bring up 
Yes, here it is. I'm going to bring up uh, Martin Linson's work here. Um, this is the the um, the one that I mentioned that has the whole Gospel of Thomas in a uh, Let me try to get to the beginning of it so you see the title page and everything. Um, this is, here we go. This is a, um, it's in the form of a interlinear type Bible. If you click on a logion, here, here's the, uh, an example of the Coptic. So he calls this the true words of Thomas, an interactive Coptic English translation. So this is based on the Coptic, not the Greek. And what he has here is every logion in the index it is a hyperlink. So if you click on the logion, like let's take um, logion two, you have the English translation down here. You have the Coptic up here and on these hyperlinks, if you wanna find out what does he mean by disturbed, you'll see that word is right here in the Coptic. If you click on that, you'll go right into a lexicon and the lexicon will give you further information and definitions and usage of that word. So uh, Linson's work can be very valuable for those of you that want to do serious study. I will give you one caveat. His viewpoint is that the Gospel of Thomas precedes the Synoptic Gospels. So um, he's quite unique in that uh, viewpoint. Uh, he's not totally unique, but um, very few scholars would agree with that. Then we also have up here this article in the uh, Biblical Archaeological Society. The Gospel of Thomas doesn't contain authentic sayings of Jesus. So I would highly recommend that. People read that. I have also a variety of different pictures for you of what the Coptic looks like. These are Greek letters primarily. That's how the Coptic um, alphabet is formed. Then there are some unique Coptic letters that are added. Okay, so that gives you the basics for the Gospel of Thomas. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about the Aramaic. Craig Evans, as I mentioned, believes that Logia 54 is very similar to the Syriac Matthew 5.3. Brian Snodgrass believes that Logia 65 to 66 look very much like the old Syriac Gospels. So it looks like either in the core text there was Aramaic or in the redaction they used Aramaic text. Nicholas Perrin, uh, as I mentioned, compared the Gospel of Thomas with Tashin's Diatessaron from 172 CE. April Deconic believes that it was carried from Jerusalem to eastern Syria and also compares it with Tashin. Diatessaron and the old Syriac Gospels. There's a few other things that I want to bring out. Um,
in uh, Long Year in 12, it says, the disciples said to Jesus, we know that you're going to leave us. Who will be our leader? And Jesus said to them, no matter where you are, you are to go to James the Just, or Yaakov, the brother of Jesus, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. So this compares the authority in succession from Jesus to James, or Yaakov, uh, which we see in Acts chapter 15. And we also have an epistle in the New Testament that James wrote. So this ties it into Jerusalem. Um, in uh, Logan 61, we have Salome said, Who are you, mister? You have climbed onto my couch and eaten from my table as if you are from someone. That last phrase, as if you are from someone, doesn't make any sense in Coptic or Greek, but it does if you look at it in the uh, form of an Aramaic idiom, which means suddenly. So you have climbed onto my couch and eaten from my table as if suddenly. So again, it looks like it came from an Aramaic uh, text and doesn't make sense in Coptic. We have in uh, Logion 100, they showed Jesus a gold coin. Gold coins were not very common in the ancient world, except in Syria. So this again ties it into an area where Aramaic was the main language. So now uh, that we've basically covered this, you might ask, well, What's the big idea that we can get from this gospel? Logging on two admonishes us to seek and that when we seek, we'll be disturbed, but to keep on seeking until we have found what we're looking for. Logging on 22 talks about breaking down barriers and integrating. And logging on 70 emphasizes that this learning must come from within. If we don't have it within us, if we don't get the knowledge that way, uh, we're not going to get it. So it has to, the light has to be turned on, but that light has got to be within us to begin with. Okay, uh, that's it. I want to thank you for following along with me today, and uh, may you be blessed in your studies.